Today, we're diving into the quantum realm of manifestation and exploring an aspect of your life that might surprise you, your wardrobe. That's right. We're talking about the impact of colors on your energy and how choosing the right colors can enhance your ability to create the life you desire. Now, let's talk about one color that you might want to reconsider wearing if you're serious about manifesting your dreams. But before we delve into that, let's revisit a fundamental concept from my teachings, the power of the unknown. The unknown, that space of unpredictability, uncertainty, and unfamiliarity is where the magic happens. It's the quantum place of uncertainty where all manifestations come from. When we step into the unknown, we are tapping into the infinite possibilities of the quantum field. Most people's brains are organized to reflect everything they know in their lives, essentially a record of the past. If you find yourself feeling the same way every single day, it means you're anchored to the past. Emotions and feelings are the end product of past experiences. So, the fundamental question becomes, can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience yet? Can you create a vision in your mind so vivid, so detailed, that your brain starts to believe it's already happened? The latest research in neuroscience and neuroplasticity tells us that we can change our brain to look like the event has already occurred. But it's not just about thinking, it's about feeling. Can you emotionally embrace a future reality to such a degree that you fall in love with it? When you do this, your body begins to believe it's living in that future reality in the present moment. You're signaling new genes and preparing your body for the manifestation of that event. Now, when we talk about manifesting your dreams, it all comes down to two things, a clear intention and detailed planning. You need to envision and feel what it would be like to live the life you desire. Write down the details, fortify your dream, and watch how your brain begins to work in new ways. The first step is becoming conscious of your unconscious thoughts. Notice your automatic habits, behaviors, and the emotions that answer you to the past. Awareness is key. If you can become so conscious of the old self that it never slips by your awareness again, you're on the path to change. Plan your behaviors, review them in your mind, and repeat. Nerve cells that fire together, wire together. You're creating a new state of mind, breaking the habit of the old self and reinventing a new self. It's a process of unlearning and relearning. It doesn't matter your age, your shape, or if you've ever meditated before. The key is to believe in yourself and the possibilities that lie ahead. You don't need 40 years of dedication to meditation. You just need to understand the formula. I want to take a moment to share a personal story, a moment of transformation that changed the course of my life. It's a story that involves hitting rock bottom, facing challenges, and ultimately making a decision that shifted my entire reality. There was a time when I found myself holding bottles of pills, desperately seeking an escape from the challenges and struggles that life had thrown at me. It was a dark moment, a moment when everything seemed overwhelming and the weight of the world pressed down on me. But in that very moment, something extraordinary happened. Instead of succumbing to despair, I made a conscious decision a decision to get well, to rise above the circumstances that seemed insurmountable. It was a defining moment, a turning point where I chose to take control of my destiny. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. If you're constantly siphoning your energy into the past or a predictable future, you're limiting your creative potential. Being present in the moment is a victory. It's training the body to surrender to a new mind. When the body surrenders to a new mind, there's a liberation of energy. Anxiety and depression start to fade away as you no longer obsess about the future or feel hopeless about the past. Your body transitions from matter to energy and you experience the beauty of the present moment. Let's dive a bit deeper into the world of colors and understand how they can affect your energy, especially when it comes to manifesting your dreams. Imagine your life as a canvas, and the colors you choose to surround yourself with are like the brush strokes that shape your experiences. 
Now, the color we're shining a spotlight on today is one that might surprise you. It's a color you may want to steer clear of if you're truly committed to manifesting your dreams. But before we unveil this color, let's take a step back and explore how colors have a unique way of influencing our emotions and mindset. Picture a rainbow, a spectrum of colors, each with its own distinct energy. These colors go beyond mere aesthetics. They hold a vibrational frequency that can impact our thoughts, feelings, and overall well-being. So, when we talk about manifesting our dreams, understanding the energetic properties of colors becomes crucial. Now, let's address the color that might be affecting your manifestation journey, black. Black is a color often associated with mystery, sophistication, and, at times, a sense of formality. However, it's essential to recognize that the energy of black can also have some drawbacks, especially when it comes to creating the life you desire. Let's talk about the color black and why you might want to think twice before adding it to your wardrobe. Now, don't worry. I'm here to explain without causing any panic. The color black, often associated with mourning, darkness, and a sense of heaviness, can have an impact on your mindset and emotions that you may not even realize. When you wear black, there's a chance it might anchor you to a past state of mind. It can evoke emotions tied to mourning or a heavy-hearted feeling, hindering your ability to manifest the positive changes you desire in your life. It's like carrying around a shadow that holds you back from stepping into the light of a brighter future. But fear not, instead of sticking to black, consider opting for vibrant colors that bring joy, abundance, and positivity into your life. Colors like red, yellow, and green can do wonders for your mood and contribute to the creation of a new, empowered version of yourself. Let's break it down a bit. Red is a color that exudes energy, passion, and a sense of vitality. When you wear red, you're inviting the kind of enthusiasm and determination that propels you forward towards your goals. It's like putting on a superhero cape, ready to conquer the day. Now, yellow is the color of sunshine, happiness, and optimism. When you choose yellow, you're infusing your day with positivity and radiance. It's like carrying a little piece of sunshine with you, brightening not only your mood, but also the energy you bring to those around you. And let's not forget about green, the color of nature, growth, and balance. When you wear green, you're connecting with the calming and harmonious energy of the natural world. It's like taking a stroll through a serene forest, bringing a sense of balance and renewal to your life. The journey of manifestation is not just about thoughts and intentions. It's about consciously creating a life defined by a vision of the future. Choosing the right colors is just one small but significant step on this incredible journey. You have the power to shape your reality. Be conscious of your choices, both in thoughts and in colors. Step into the unknown, embrace the present moment, and watch as the universe aligns to manifest your dreams. The hardest part about change, really, in creating the life that you want, being defined by a vision of the future instead of a memory of the past, is not making the same choices you did the day before. And the moment you do that, you step into the unknown. When you begin to realize the unknown is the perfect place to create from, that void of unpredictability, that uncertainty, that unfamiliarity, is really the quantum place of uncertainty where all manifestations come from. So when you and I become comfortable living in that unknown place, I think then that we begin to manifest the things we want in our lives. So for me personally, I want to execute and be defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past. So most people's brains are organized to reflect everything they know in their life. Their brain is a record of the past. And if you feel the same way every single day, and feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, it means number one, nothing new is happening in your life, and number two, those emotions are keeping you anchored to the past. 
if thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body and how you think and how you feel creates a state of being most people are literally biologically neurologically chemically genetically and even quantum wise connected to a past so then the question is, the fundamental question is, can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain has literally changed to look like the experience has already occurred? Now, the latest research in neuroscience and neuroplasticity tells us we can change our brain to look like the event has already occurred. And can we begin to emotionally embrace a future reality that's a potential in the quantum field and begin to emotionally embrace it to such a degree that we fall in love with that future reality, that our body as our unconscious mind begins to believe it's living in that future reality in the present moment and we're signaling new genes and new ways to change our body to look like the experience has already occurred in preparation for the event. When you truly do this properly, you're not waiting for your success to feel empowered. You're not waiting for your wealth to feel abundant. You're not waiting for your new relationship to feel love. You're not waiting for the mystical moment to feel awe. So if you're talking about manifesting your dreams, well, it only requires two things. It requires a clear intention. An intention is a vision, a possibility. The moment you say, what would it be like to be healthy? What would it be like to be wealthy? What would it be like to have a new home? What would it be like to have a great job? And you get this idea in your mind that's intention. Then you write down the details. Okay, I want to travel around the world. I want to have great benefits, great insurance. I want to work with really cool people. I want to have a chance to be creative. And you list all of those individual elements to fortify your dream. The more you get clear on those details, the more your brain begins to work in new ways. Anytime you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind. Now, the moment you get inspired and you begin to feel what it would be like to live in that future, your body is getting a chemical sampling, an emotional sampling. It's getting a taste of the future. So the first thing you have to do is you have to become conscious of your unconscious thoughts. You have to notice your automatic habits and behaviors. You have to become aware of your emotions that keep you anchored to the past. And if you can become so conscious of the unconscious states of mind and body that they would never slip by your conscious awareness again, you're becoming familiar with the old self so you don't return. Then if you begin to think about new ways of being, being defined by a vision, plan your behaviors, review them in your mind. Now, if you keep doing that over and over again, nerve cells that fire together, wire together, you begin to become familiar with a new state of mind. At the same time, if you can emotionally cultivate your inspiration, your joy, your enthusiasm, the head of the experience, by repeating that over and over again, cultivating that state, it's going to begin to become familiar to you. So then the process of change then requires unlearning and relearning, breaking the habit of the old self, reinventing a new self, pruning synaptic connections, as we say in neuroscience, and sprouting new connections. You are, it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, in shape, out of shape, not even if you've ever meditated before, it doesn't even matter. That's when it gets kind of cool, because this is when you start believing in yourself. And when you believe in yourself, you believe in possibilities right? When you believe in possibilities, you got to believe in yourself. People are waking up and going, wow, it doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how healthy you are. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, in shape, out of shape. Not even if you've ever meditated before, it doesn't even matter. It's a formula, and you don't need 40 years of dedication to meditation to get it. You just got to understand the formula. You're going to figure it out sooner or later, and it's going to get easier, and it's going to get fun. You know, my rock bottom was sitting there, and it was like a meta perspective of myself, you know? And I could see myself sitting on the edge of the bed, holding these bottles of pills to knock myself out so I can sleep. 
And that's when I decided, like I decided to get well in that moment after I'd gotten all those no's. You'll never forget that moment. That is the moment that defined you. Paying attention is being present. And it's a skill just like anything else. The more you practice it, the better you get at it. And you know when someone's present with you in your life because they're paying attention to you. And you know when they're not present with you because they're not paying attention to you. So where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you have all of your attention in the present moment, you're conserving a lot of energy to create with. If I'm talking to you and you're thinking about where you're going to go for lunch and who you're going to go with and how you're going to get there, and I'm talking to you, you left the present moment and your attention went to some future and your energy will go down and you won't be able to comprehend what I said. If you start thinking about what you should have said at the staff meeting three days ago and I'm talking to you and your mind is back in the past, you're siphoning energy out of the present moment into the past. People are constantly siphoning their energy into a familiar past or a predictable future because that's where their attention is. And the stronger the emotions that we feel to certain problems and conditions in our life, the more we pay attention to them. So we give our power away to our ex. We give our power away to that big problem. And that's creative energy that we should be able to use to create a new future. Now the person's back in the past. But if they become aware that they're siphoning energy out of the present moment into the past and they settle the body back down into the present moment, that's a victory. And those victories add up and you're telling the body in that moment that it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind, and that's a victory. You become aware that your body wants to get up and move, and you're in the meditation. And you tell your body, uh-uh, you bring it back to the present moment, you settle it back down, you are training the animal. That's a victory. Now you're executing a will that's greater than the program because most people lose their free will to a program. Now you're telling the body, I'll tell you when we get up, not when you want to get up. You're not the mind, I'm the mind. And that's a victory. If you keep doing this and you stay with it, sooner or later the body's going to surrender to a new mind. And when that happens, there's a liberation of energy. The body is freed from those habituations and those emotions. The body's going from particle to wave, from matter to energy. And all of a sudden you're dialing down the anger. You're dialing down the vigilance. And the body now is being conditioned to a new mind. That is the present moment. And when you're in that present moment, something really amazing happens. You forget about you. You're basically just an awareness. You're in the unknown. And that is the perfect place to create from. So it turns out that when people do this properly, they heal themselves of anxiety. Why? Because they're no longer obsessing about some future. When they find the present moment, they heal from their depression because they're not hopeless and powerless in their past. The body's conditioned now. This realm has an infinite amount of space. Space is eternal, and we experience time as we move through space. When you feel that feeling and it's visceral, no person, no thing, no experience will stand in the way between you and that vision, and you will be initiated by the universe into wealth. Once you start feeling unlimited, once you start feeling abundant, once you start feeling worthy, now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind has intellectually understood. Now it begins to come to you. You become the vortex or the magnet to your destiny. You are not going anywhere to get anything. You are actually collapsing space and time and you are drawing the experience to you. You are the vortex because when there's a vibrational match between your energy and that potential that exists in the quantum field by tuning a radio dial, when you lock into that frequency, if you keep revisiting that energetic signature over again every single day, then you don't have to go anywhere and get it. The new job finds you, the new house actually finds you, the new relationship finds you because you are the vortex that's drawing the experience to you. The universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving, so we got to come initiated into this and understand it. If you want to create a new life, 
a new personal reality, you got to change your personality, which means you better start thinking about what you've been thinking about and changing it. You begin to become conscious of your unconscious actions or habits or behaviors and modify them and then we have to begin to look at the emotions that we live by every single day that keep us connected to the past and decide do these emotions belong in our future. So most people are trying to create a new personal reality as the same personality and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. And can you select a new possibility in the quantum field and begin to emotionally embrace that future every single day to such a degree that your body as the unconscious mind, the objective mind, does not know the difference between the experience in your life that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone to the degree that you begin to signal new genes and new ways to change your body to look like the experience has already happened. Now the latest research in epigenetics says it's absolutely possible. Now think about this. Every day installing the circuitry, every day conditioning the body into the emotion of the future that your body begins to change to look like it's already happened. Now this is where it gets fun because now you no longer have to go anywhere to get it. If you think that your thoughts have something to do with your future, just from a theoretical standpoint that your thoughts create your destiny and you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, well then your life isn't going to change very much as long as you're thinking the same way. If you're not being defined by a vision of the future, then you're left with the memories of the past. Is it possible then that the way you think and the way you feel can begin to produce effects in your outer world? Now that isn't something that you swallow in one bite. It's a process of gaining knowledge. It's a process of practice. It's a process of experience. Once you start seeing those synchronicities, those coincidences, those opportunities that start to fall into place, because you're experiencing change in your outer world, if you're doing the work, you're going to start paying attention to what you're doing inside of you that's producing the effect outside of you. Once you correlate the changes of what you're doing inside of you with the effect you produce outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did and you're going to do it again. And all of a sudden you're going to start believing more that you're the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life those same thoughts lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the exact same experiences, and we anticipate the same feelings or emotions from those experiences. And those emotions are the payoff that drive our very same thoughts. So our biology, our neurocircuitry, our neurochemistry, our hormones, and even our gene expression will be equal to how we think, how we act, and how we feel. And how we think, how we act, and how we feel is called our personality, and our personality creates our personal reality. That's it. I want people to begin to understand that thoughts are very powerful, feelings drive our thoughts, and that they can begin to create a better life for themselves once they understand some of these principles. We live in a world where often when people think about visioning the future, they vision stuff. So you have a vision of the car you want, or you have a vision of an amount of money you want, or you have a vision of a home you want, and you see this with people with their vision boards. What's your take on that? And is that the right type of visioning? And what is the right type of visioning? Well, we do so many different variations because I think people integrate information differently. And all of those cars and homes and whatever that is, there are symbols of what it looks like when a person actually arrives at this concept called abundance, right? So if those things help them to associate with something that creates a feeling of abundance and they're building their vision board to help them to get clear on their intent, then that's fine because they're associating objects or things or material things that they'll say, that's when I know that I'm abundant. That's fine. Other people will say, look, abundance just means that I have more than I need and I'm happy with that. And for them, there's a feeling that is associated with that. 
and when they begin to dream about their future, they may see themselves in a scene or see themselves a certain way. I don't care what it takes for the person to get there because once they have their abundance, and this happens quite a bit in our work, when you finally have everything you want, there's only one thing you're going to ask yourself. How am I going to contribute to the world? How am I going to make a difference? So we use different tools to help people to get to that point. But if the person's doing the vision board and they're saying, when I get my new car, I get my new house, I get my new relationship, then I'm gonna feel so great. Well, then they're back to the program waiting for it to happen, for them to feel the emotion. They're believing their outer world has to change in order for them to feel better. There's no effect of drawing the experience to you that way. So the person has to use those tools to get them into the emotional state for them to feel like it's already happened. Now think about this. If you get up from a creative process and you feel grateful, you feel a love for life, you feel a joy for existence, you feel a passion for the moment, you will not be looking for your future because you'll feel like it's already happened. It's the moment that we start feeling those self-limiting emotions, that we feel separation, and then we start looking for it again. Well then, if you're waiting, you're not creating, you're in separation again. So then, whatever it takes for you to move into a state of being, and what is a state of being? Thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain. Feelings are the vocabulary of your body. How you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So then if you wake up in the morning and you come back to your senses with a clean slate and you say, I don't feel anything, you say, well, let me start thinking about all the problems in my life. Well, all those problems are connected to different people or different objects or things at different times and places. The moment you remember your problems, a memory is a record of the past. You're thinking in the past. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with them. So all of a sudden you start feeling unhappy, you start feeling bitter, you start feeling frustrated. So now your body's in the past. So then most people then create a state of being that's connected to their past. And if they're in the familiar past, then they are going to crave the predictable future and they're going to fall back into routine. So then we want people then to get very clear on that vision of their future, however they do it, and begin to combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion. And the stronger the emotion they feel from the vision they're creating, the more altered they feel inside of them, the more they're going to pay attention to the pictures in their mind. And now they're remembering the future. The knowledge creates awareness. Awareness creates consciousness. Consciousness and energy are connected, so there's a change in energy globally going on with the world. Now that knowledge and that change of energy has effects on paradigms that are no longer a vibrational match with that new level of consciousness. This is the time we've been waiting for. This is where it's happening in the Milky Way. This is happening here because there's a true coming of a new consciousness. It's not one person that's coming. It's a collective consciousness that's emerging. If you look around the world right now, whether you're looking at the economic model or the political model or even certain aspects of the religious model, the environment, the medical model, there's several different parts of our culture that's beginning to collapse. If you study human nature, historically, we always wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis, both as an individual and as a culture before we decide to change. If you look at this and you study it in history, it's a sign that something new has to be born because the old model of reality begins to change, something else has to replace it. So we have two ways that we actually face crisis. We can either face crisis in a state of emergency, which in the beginning of a crisis is healthy, or we can face crisis in a state of creativity and innovation. If you're addressing a financial crisis or a crisis in a culture and everybody is selfish and everybody's living by those emotions, then they're pushing their way to get to the head of the line. They're competing, they're forcing outcomes, they're using very primitive systems to try to take care of themselves. We know from the physiology of the brain that most of the blood supply goes to the hindbrain and away from the forebrain. 
Those chemicals create a gap between the way things appear in our life and the way things really are. In other words, we're viewing reality in an altered state, so we don't see possibility. We feel separate from each other. We are competing and striving to get to the head of the line by using our cunning, manipulative, egocentric ways to get there, and we're very controllable. Fear is very controllable. Competition is very controllable. Anger and war divides individuals. Now that is not a way to address a crisis because the service to self or taking care of the self is the exact thing that enhances the crisis. Because if you and I are all doing the same, if we're all doing the same thing, then a culture becomes more divided. It becomes more disintegrated. It becomes more incoherent. And possibility then is not part of the equation. So the other state of mind, if you can view crisis as a great opportunity, brilliantly disguised as an impossible situation, and you have to match the conditions in your environment with a new mind. Now we're talking about greatness, because innovation and creativity and a new way of thinking and a new way of being means that we can't do the same thing from the past. And so in history, cultures that are individuals that overcame their environmental conditions were considered mystics and saints and leaders and charismatic leaders. They were individuals that saw past the illusion of the present reality. When we begin to become innovative or creative, the brain begins to switch. We begin to turn on the forebrain, the frontal lobe, which is really the crowning achievement of the human being. And we begin to ask bigger questions. How can we create a new way of being in a world that's falling apart? How can we begin to create a new system to adapt to these conditions? And I think that people, when they begin to feel empowered by possibility, when they begin to see that the death of the old paradigms means the beginning of a new paradigm. How many people actually believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life? So how many people actually woke up this morning and consciously created a future? You know, the biggest reason why people don't do it is because you don't really believe it's true. You see, if you knew on a gut level that it was absolutely true, would you ever miss a day and would you ever let any thoughts slip by your awareness that you didn't want to experience? So your brain, according to neuroscience, is organized to reflect everything you know in your life.